So this conference hot. will now be recorded. And it's also Zok. But okay, I go by well, Zok. Zok, okay. So just for those who are new, we do record these groups because um, there are a lot of people who listen to them later, sometimes well over 100. And um, for people who also are on the group and want to re-listen to things they might have missed, um, the other piece of information going in I want to give everybody is that we use a chat window in here. It's the little question mark bubble in the top right hand corner. It can be pretty active at times. Um, recommend you keep it open and you'll pick up a lot of stuff and that chat bubble, that chat log is recorded on your computer in the uh, on a PC, it's in documents, look for chat log. And um, I don't know exactly where it is on an Apple, but I can tell you it is, it is um, held somewhere in your files automatically. Um, you'll need to find it or if somebody knows where it is on an apple they should put it in the chat log and then uh, and then we'll have it there so why don't we why don't we start with um with owen um who i know a little bit about i have to say but not a lot um because jay called me over the weekend and um we have a little um format that we use so that we can move through stuff pretty quickly Owen. Um, and so I'm going to ask you a bunch of questions you may know the answers you may not if you don't um, don't worry there's no pass fail on this um, so it's Owen Zock and Owen how old are you I am 74 as of early this month okay and you live in Baton Rouge because you told us that Correct. Um, and what year were you first diagnosed? 2017, four 2017. years ago. Do you remember what your Gleason score and your PSA level were when you got diagnosed? Well, it had uh, gradually creeped up over the years and just looking at my chart in uh, 2014, December of 2014, it had reached 9.6. And then over the succeeding two years or so, it um, decreased, lowered. And um, then, <laughs> then in June of um, 2017, it uh, reached 10.08. And at that okay. point, my urologist said, we, after having done three prostate biopsies over the course of several years before, he said, we'll have to do an MRI guided biopsy. And right. so that came back positive with uh, some indication of cancer, uh, Gleason's six. And uh, so, I then scheduled with uh, an oncologist here at the Pennington Cancer Center in Baton Rouge. Uh, it's part of Baton Rouge General Hospital, uh, the placement of radioactive seeds, brachytherapy with 79 um, iodine-125 right. seeds. So let, let me ask you, when you th this guided biopsy, how many how many cores were positive that time? No, I don't remember the number without going back to the. Report. Okay, okay, uh, and but they were they were all three plus three. There wasn't a four to be seen. No, I don't think so. Okay, and since then, since you had the breaky seeds in two thousand and seventeen. Have you continued to see um, a urologist or a radiation oncologist? Well, both. I would see okay. the uh, I call the urologist probably every four months initially, and the oncologist every six months initially. 
and the um, the urologist kept track of the PSA. And so, well, I think that answers your question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I have to believe the the uh, radonc kept track of your PSA too. Otherwise, he wouldn't be much of a radonc if he didn't uh, if he didn't know where your PSA was going. Um, now. Um, I'm assuming you didn't, because you were three plus three, you didn't do any scans at the time. Is that right? Or did they scan you originally? Uh, he did a bone scan. Oh, he did. Initially before, before the seed placement, yes. Okay. Interesting, because maybe because of the seed placement, um, but normally they don't scan you unless you've got a four in your number. Um, and um, and it was negative. And so tell us what's happened since 2017. I've been continuing to see both the urologist on a decreasing frequency up until, well, this past year, uh, and seeing the oncologist every six months or once a year, it, it decreased after things seem to be kind of stable at a relatively low level in the point, 0 0.5, 0 0.3, 0 0.2 range until uh, I guess a month ago, November, I think it was, well, I saw, let me look at my chart here, in, uh, December of 20, I had a reading of 0.36. In June of 21, it was 0 0.349, 0 0.49. So then I saw my oncologist by just by a routine schedule in, um, I guess it was this month, early this month I saw him and um, he took a test. He said, you've had two readings that increased. So if we see another increase now, that would be a biological failure, I guess they call it. Three mm -hmm. readings in a row that are higher than the nadir. Mm -hmm. And so it turned out to be 0.91. He had already scheduled me earlier that day for a PET scan. So the PET scan, well, as it turned out, then later that day, I got the results of the PSA was 0.91. So he was, he had anticipated correctly. And, but the PET, he called me and said the PET scan was normal. And I asked him a few questions about that. How sensitive is the PET scan? And he said, well, it's about, it can resolve about a uh, half a centimeter. And I said, well, that's not very, that's not very good. I mean, that's the size of so a PET. What, what type of PET scan was it? I don't know. I asked the technician what kind of element was injected or a tracer was injected. And he said something that sounded like chlorine or chloride, and it yeah, sounded see, to me like he wasn't too sure what he was talking right. about. So um, let me ask you a couple of questions, and then we'll get into seeing if we can help you a little bit. And I know I've, I've, I've channeled a little bit of advice back to you through, um, through Jay, so that w I suspect that you're going to hear much the same thing at this point in time. Um, have you ever, do you have any History of cancer in your family, Owen? Uh, my mother died of breast cancer. My father okay. had melanoma, but that was Ooh. that was treated, and he d did not die of cancer. He died at 88 and a half years of other causes. Okay. And um, have you ever had any type of genetic testing yourself? No. Okay. So um, we would strongly recommend that you talk to one of your docs about a germline test, which is to see if you've got um, 
uh, an inherited um, uh, mutation could come from either your mother or your father, and it could be in the BRCA germline from both melanoma and breast cancer, and it could be important because since you have some sort of recurrence, it would seem, um, it might indicate the best type of treatment for you. Um, so we know, and, and we'll, we'll go a little bit more into that, um, I know that um, how you found us, um, and I think that Jay has signed you up already onto our database. But if he hasn't, stick your uh, please stick your email in the chat window, and we'll make sure you get reminders for all these meetings. Um, or you can sign up yourself on the website. Um, just to tell the group what I suggested to Jay from what I knew wasn't quite as detailed. Um, I suggested that right away you try and get a Pilarify scan because that's probably the easiest type of PSMA scan to, um, to get. And um, secondly, uh, I recommended three docs. Um, Oliver Sartor in at Tulane, and then also in Houston, um, Paul Korn and Eleni F. Stathew. And um, and I think the one thing that um, just to save us all saying the same thing that we all recommend is that you have to move your care right now to a specialized genito urinary medical oncologist. Genito urinary means somebody who specializes in diseases in the genitourinary area like prostate cancer, testicular cancer, bladder cancer, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I think that it's really important. And I think that um, if it were me, I'd be asking my local radonc or urologist to order a Pilarify scan right away whilst you're making that appointment because it won't hurt if you can walk in with the results, whichever one of those three docs you you choose and okay. with that i will pass it back to len who's back with us and probably heard enough to to take over len are you comfortable or, or not no, no, i have rather... no idea you know what what's been discussed uh, okay with Irwin. so if you want to finish Irwin, then i'll take it yeah I'll, I'll yep i'll finish up with owen and we haven't asked we don't know who needs time either we just plunge right in until you came back because you had those notes okay yeah. um so let me open it up we've got a bunch of uh we've got a bunch of people who are making comments in the chat window we've got carl we've got peter um who would like to kick off well Al oliver sartar at tulane is uh is a real expert in uh mutations in genetic and uh synomic mutations so um and he's close i mean uh, if it was me i would probably hop in a car and try to make an appointment with him because he's close and he's one of the leading experts in, in genetic stuff so just to cr just to be able to cross that off the list it's only about 12 percent of us that have a germline mutation but uh it could make a world of difference in treatment if you knew what you if you knew you had something like that. I see my oncologist tomorrow and uh, want to ask a lot of questions about him and and want to suggest these kind of ideas to him. So it's very timely uh, this meeting with uh, Jay and this meeting with you guys today will be most helpful. I appreciate everything you guys have said. I have a question that you were saying about a PET scan and I didn't understand what type of PET scan was mentioned. So it was a, probably if it if it include if it was chlorine it was probably a C11 PET scan. No, what C are you recommending that I I get? Okay. So we are recommending you get something called um, Pilarify, 
which I'll spell for you, P-Y-L-A-R-I-F-Y. It is a type of PET scan where the um, the, contra the, the, the contrast is, um, is guided to the prostate cancer cells. It's attracted to something called prostate-specific membrane antigen. And PSMA is a, um, an antigen that is expressed on the surface of a prostate cell, any prostate cell, healthy or, or, or cancer. And um, it's then, dra it drags with it a uh, gallium, excuse me, in this place, uh, in this instance, um, uh, fluoroclovine. Uh, am I saying that right? Somebody correct me. Uh, it's, uh, radioactive fluorine, 18F. 18F, radioactive fluorine, sorry. It's on it's and, <laughs> And it lights up, and it lights up the cell, and it sees down to um, quite a bit less than five millimeters. Okay. okay. Now it's part. It is possible. It's possible that at the five millimeters, it might have been an axiom in scan that you had, seventeen f fluoroclovine. Um, but I, we honestly don't know. It might not. If he said chlorine, it was it was not an axiom in scan. The best scan for you to get with your level of PSA right now is a PSMA scan, and the most readily available PSMA scan where you live is and and reliable would be Pilarify. And the other thing I just want to say to you, and you'll hear it here again, is you have to ask your doc for this and not ask him what he suggests because some of this is new technology and a lot of times these docs aren't comfortable with the new technology and he's going to dis he may discourage you if well he Rick, you, i mean oliver sartor will not no no we're not talking about oliver sartor Herb. he's going to see his radiation oncologist ah. tomorrow ah okay and and yes if you could if you could go in to see sartor tomorrow or Dr. Korn or Dr. Estafio, it wouldn't be a problem. But when you go into these community guys, you know, that, that are in remote locations, they, they may not be comfortable with the technology. And so we try to tell you, be your own best advocate. Yeah, I and, will ask for a referral to Dr. Sartor. Okay. But try and get the Pilarify scan ordered sooner rather than later. Yeah. So you can take it with you when you go see him. I have uh, I looked up where I can actually call Polarify, the, the pharmaceutical company that makes the, the agent and was right. able to get the locations, the five nearest locations to Baton Rouge. One is in Baton Rouge. Several are in smaller communities around there. And a, they're all by Mary Bird Perkins Cancer Center is based in Baton Rouge. The other one is, I can't remember the name of it, but there is one in New Orleans as well. And uh, so you might call all five and see who can get you in first. And, uh, or ask. Some of the, some yeah. of the things that are trying to make things happen quickly is, is sort of frustrating when you leave it up to the office. But if you can help them out and, and do it yourself, it's also like sharing the medical records. I'm hoping that they have the staff and the time to um, to move your records from Red Onk's office to Sartor's office to Beverly over there. But right. it may be that uh, it would move quicker if you asked them to move it. And could you have a copy too? And then you move that because they may mess it up. Sometimes they don't send all all the records either. Sometimes they, they leave things out just through sloppiness. Uh, oh, Owen, we, we have trained Mr. Mills very well, yeah. as you can hear. Um, what I do want to say is I don't know how long you will wait for a, an appointment with Sartor. And that might be a consideration because he may be booked out into February or March. And that may be a consideration in terms of whether you see him or not. If they suggest somebody else, take the appointment, but come back here next week and talk to us and maybe we can get you, if 
if you feel you want it, we can probably get you a, a quicker appointment in Houston. One one thing about Sartor's office, Beverly is his gatekeeper. And when I tried to schedule with him, she would not schedule until she had the records. I had one hospital send them. I think it was, um, anyway, I had one hospital send them to him and they didn't find them. And I ended up having to send them myself to Beverly and uh, getting them in X. I think I physically took copies and made copies and sent them FedEx. Once I did, you could carry them from where you are. You're only an hour away. Um, and a lot of times the charming, the, uh, the gatekeeper is the key to making things happen. Calling and saying, I understand my appointment's a month out, but I just called again today just to see if there was any openings and stuff like that will, will work. That's all good. Anyone else want to give um, Owen words of wisdom they've picked up from hanging around Ancan? Go ahead, Jay. I wanted to ask about genetic testing. I remember there were two two outfits that did uh, when I did it. Two outfits that were the best known. One was color i think and i forgot the other both were on west coast as i recall what what advice do we have for Irwin on which one to choose from if, if given the choice um if the doc if the doc orders it um they they're probably likely to use um is it um in in intel intel yeah in Vitae. In Vitae. In Yeah. Um, they're good. I mean, there's so many now. Color, you can order yourself. Um, but then it, you're not going to get it covered, but it's 250 bucks. But, you know, your doc, um, you, tomorrow ask your radonc to put in an order. Tell him your mother had breast cancer. Your dad had melanoma. You just want to, you want to check. And if you tell him that, He's going to say sure. That, and whoever, that, he, whoever he goes to is fine. That may help him say yes to some of your uh, other questions, too, if, you, if there's something that he can do for you. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, thanks. Anyone, anyone else? Yeah, Rick, uh, Joel here. Um, I, yes, just Joel. The, I just took the color test for free. Uh, if you sign up through the Promise website, they will do it for free instead of paying the 250. Oh, and there you go. So Promise is a Promise is a trial that's going on right now. What, Joel? Why don't you tell the guys about Promise? It's worth it. Well, Promise is brand new. I was a consultant on the Promise uh, website to start with when they created it, and not that I helped a lot, but. Uh, they um, just came out about two or three months ago, and uh, if you go uh, there and sign up, uh, they will ask you about on the internet about an hour's worth of questions, and you just fill in. Uh, the longest part of the questions was, uh, my mother had 16 brothers and sisters. You have all to list all the brothers and sisters on both sides of the family and what they died of. And uh, so, um, but basically about an hour's worth of time, then they send you a kit in the mail, uh, which you uh, do a spit test into a, a test tube. You send it back to them. About a month later, they give you a report. Uh, I happen to have taken both the Invitae and the color tests in the past three, four years. And uh, they both said the same thing, that I had one gene uh, for uh, colon cancer, nothing to do with prostate in my case. But uh, they're very uh, professional. Even when they're done, uh, you can call them at any time. They'll talk to you. I was counseled by a genetic counselor for free also at the end of the test. Um, and uh, so um, it was a pretty painless endeavor. And uh, I like the price. And this is uh, think, Don Price. I think we got we got to move along here and i'm going to ask uh and you'll forgive us if we move through we've got a bunch of new guys and a lot of people and we have a hard stop tonight at 5 20 because um the ms people are coming into the room after us um len i'm going to ask if, if we could talk to mark horn next because 
he's prepping for a colonoscopy and he's not sure when he'll be in front of the camera and not. We all can empathize with that. So, um, yeah, would sure. You like, would you Hi, like to take Mark. over from, from Mark? Go ahead, you've got the floor. Thanks so much. Um, so I'm uh, at a point where it looks like I'm gonna need to start taking oxycodone. I've been avoiding it as much as I could, um, starting with half a tablet. I think that's 2.5 milligrams. Um, I don't know how it's gonna mix with, I'm using Zolpidem Ambient to Sleep. Um, and I was wondering if there's anybody, I saw Carl, um, you mentioned that you took it for a month. Um, but I'm just wondering about if anybody had experience with oxycodone. Uh, and if I could just mention also there are two other issues that I'm facing. Um, Friday a week, I'm going to start low-dose radiation therapy, 40 sessions. Uh, and if anybody's had that, I'd be interested in talking to them. And then I, in the last week, I've needed to start self-catheterizing. And if anybody's been through that um, and could offer advice, uh, I'd like to speak to them. It should be so let me let me, let me just jump in very quickly and explain to you some background on Mark, which he didn't give you, and everybody's going to say, "Well, what's your background?" Uh, I've been counselling Mark, navigating Mark since the spring. Mark, when, when was the spring? Right? Yeah. Yep. yep. Um, and it might sound to you like these are all familiar aspects of prostate cancer, but Mark doesn't have prostate cancer. Mark has uh, urothelial cancer, which is a type of bladder cancer, lower tract. And um, it's not in the bladder, it's in the prostate. And so a lot of the treatment that Mark's going through is comparable to prostate cancer. And he's had chemo already, and he's right in the middle of doing uh, Keytruda, pembrolizumab, like Carl. And um, now he finds that they want to treat the prostate, they want to blast the prostate with um, IMRT for certain reasons, um, medical reasons. He's not a good candidate for SBRT, so he can't even shorten that 48 to 25 plus SBRT. And um, he's also suffering some pain. And so um, that's the that's the elevated version of the of the background and he's been very strong and pretty amazing over the past nine months so god bless him um so let me let me turn over so you can answer um any one of those three questions catheterization um radiation with imrt and using oxycodone and not being afraid that you're going to become dependent on it. Yeah, I'd like to go to Jake for the oxycodone. He's our specialist. Okay, yeah. Hi, Mark. Um, I've, I've, I've had prostate cancer for a number of years and I've been on oxycodone um, for probably seven or eight of those years. I started out <clears throat> with a low dose um, five and 325. That's five milligrams of oxygodone and 325 Tylenol. So you're taking the half of that dose, which is essentially a baby dose. Um, and there are, stronger, there are stronger variations of it as you go up, if you, if, if and when you need it. Um, it it works. It it it, it takes the. the uh, I have pretty pretty much constant pain, and it has gotten worse with the years. Um, I'm now in hospice. Um, so I do have, I do take oxycodone. Now I'm taking two pills every three or four hours. Um, and it keeps, it, it keeps the edge off. <clears throat> Doesn't go, go away with the, the pain completely, but it keeps the edge off, makes it bearable. So I don't know exactly what kind of questions you have. Um, but I'll be certain to, to, to pipe in if I can. So thank you for sharing your experience. Um... Did did you feel that you were dependent at a certain point? Um, I'll tell you this: I wouldn't want to not have it. I would not want to be without it. As far as feeling like I'm addicted to it, okay, I, I'm a, I'm a addictive type personality. I can gamble and you know spend money on the inside straight, or I can I'm addicted to cigarettes. So I could be addicted to alcohol. I have not found myself to be addicted to oxycodone. 
I was very concerned about that when I first went to my doctor because I didn't want to be addicted. And she says, well, she told me then, and she's told me many times since then, uh, and other people have said the same thing, that people who take it for pain generally do not get addicted for chronic pain. You know, you have people, the people that get addicted are the ones who take, um, you know, they get, a, they get a toothache and the doctor gives them too many pills and they keep taking the pills far beyond what they actually needed. And then they'd find that they, they like the feeling that it gives them. Um, that's where the addiction problem comes in. If it's for pain, true pain, like you're, you know, you're experiencing now and, and like I'm experiencing, uh, I've been assured many times it is not addictive. Okay, super. I hope Appreciate that helps. That. Good, you welcome. Sure does. Sure does. Sure does. Good. We Thank have, you. We have to go to Bill Lewis for catheterizations. I hope it was a, a typo, but he says he has eight thousand catheterizations. So I can't imagine anyone uh, topping that number. And can I just introduce Bill Lewis too, because Bill's new. Sure. Um, and Bill Bill contacted me this past week. And he um, he moderates uh, an us two group in San Diego, and um, asked if he could join our group and listen in, et cetera, et cetera. And I said he is a thousand percent welcome, and we would try to give him some time in this first time around. But um, I don't know. We're getting a little pinch with new guys, but so maybe next time. But Bill, please please give your benefit of your knowledge to um, to Mark. Sure, and I gave my email address in the chat. Appreciate that a lot. But yes, it was eight thousand. I've I've been doing it for uh, six years, five times a day. Oh my gosh, oh my gosh. So, w what advice do you have for Mark, Bill? Uh, the biggest one is that you'll end up getting. Um, bladder uh, infections uh, unless you use a little um, squeeze bottle vial, say a half a half an ounce vial with isopropyl alcohol and you jam that into the end of your penis and squirt a little in there and that kills the germs that live in the first eighth of an inch inside your penis and uh, then you don't get these infections. Otherwise, uh, you know, pick a pick a uh, a good brand, and and I've got one that I'm happy with that I'd I'd be happy to share. Uh, so this uh, isopropyl alcohol is, is that by prescription or? No, no, just regular rubbing alcohol. And you just have some kind of something squeeze bottle? Yeah, just a little tiny squeeze bottle, uh, half an ounce, uh, you know, drop drop tip squeeze bottle that you fill and then you stick that jam that into the end of the uh, penis uh, squirt a little in smear it around with your finger um, rinse off the tip of the bottle and and cap it and then you put your catheter in and you're going to have far fewer uh, infections i used to get them i forget every six weeks and now i i don't get them but once a year if that that's super advice yeah, that is great. Peter, do you have, you're, you're quite an expert on catheterization too, Peter Kafka. Do you have anything to add on that? Yeah, Mark, I think I mentioned last night, I was on a poly for three and a half months, and then I was on a self-catheterization for four months plus. I I never had an infection. I was, it was amazing. I mean, I was careful, but I mean, I, I did self-catheterization at the beach while I was hiking. I mean, I I just, um, I was just careful. I mean, they've, the self-lubricating ones, the ones you, use, you know, lubricate as you're taking it out of the, out of the uh, plastic, those are probably the better ones because you're not touching anything. Um, right. I, I had no trouble with it. Um, it changed my life, self-catheterization, because it, um, it's a, I mean, it sounds creepy and all that, but it, compared to having a bag on your leg. Or, or a night bag. I mean, it's, it's just it makes it way well, better. Please, you are way better. There. Yep. So thank you both, and I hope it's okay, Bill, if I get in touch if, with some questions. Absolutely. That'd be super.
And Mark, your third question was that about IMRT radiation? Yes. I can cover that since I had 48 sessions of IMRT, uh, 86 gray, likely to be more than what you're going to get. Um, are they doing just the prostate or the, the whole pelvic region? Whole pelvic region. Whole pelvic, that's what I had. Uh, there, there is um, a, uh, a gel that they can inject between your prostate. They can't. They can't use it because Pardon? the can spread to the meso rectum. Because what? The cancer has spread to the meso rectum. It's it's approaching the rectum, so they can't. Oh. They oh. they can't use the gel. Okay, fine. Yeah. So anyway, uh, people's experience with IMRT varies. From I had I got off pretty lightly. Um, I I didn't have any fatigue. You'll hear some guys say they had a lot of fatigue. Um, I didn't have any skin burns. I've heard guys say that they, they've gotten skin burns. Um, what else? Uh, you may get a little bit of uh, diarrhea. They want you to be on a very bland, non-fiber or low-fiber diet. Uh, that'll help with that. Um, let's see, what else? Uh, you you. I didn't have any short-term toxicity or what they call acute toxicity, but you can get uh, long-term toxicity, which I did get. I had uh, radiation proctitis, which is rectal bleeding. Uh, it was happening with every bowel movement I had, uh, at, but that didn't even start until about 18 months out from the radiation. Um, now I had that taken care of, with um, argon plasma treatments, which is kind of, as far as you're concerned, you're just getting a colonoscopy. Uh, but uh, they infuse this uh, argon plasma and it um, cauterizes the, the blood vessels in, in the uh, lower colon. Uh, and it took care of it for me. Some guys don't have that problem at all. So everybody has a slightly different experience and I'll open that discussion up to everybody else who's had IMRT. Did you have yeah. 40, ses 40 sessions? I had 48, over nine 48. and a half weeks. Yeah, Monday through Friday, nine yep. and a half weeks. Well, this is Alan. I had IMRT a number of years ago in 2016. I'll give you a couple of uh, tips. Typically, they want you to come um, with a full bladder not bursting full, but a um, reasonably full. I guess it helps uh, a full bladder sort of helps to um, push uh, push it away from uh, the radiation zone. It's not perfect, but uh, usually that's what they want. And so consistency of volume, I was told, was important more so than you know the exact number. So whatever works for you and it's comfortable. In terms of timing, you're drinking water before you leave your house and the time it takes to get to the facility, et cetera. And what I found was very helpful was that in my bag of you know reading material and odds and ends, I carried a, a, uh, a plastic urinal, basically a, a way to measure urine volume. And so after the session, when I went to the bathroom, I took note of, of what that volume was. And while it sounds sort of silly, what it did for me was that it sort of helped me calibrate the fullness sensation in my bladder right. um, with what I was drinking and the time frame. And so that um, after, I don't know, three, four, five sessions, I got it down pretty well. In fact, the people were so surprised at the end, they, they said you were very consistent. I told them, well, this is the, the trick that I use. Um, so that's one tip. Um, the other thing is, for me, um, I agree with the diet. You had to do a little bit of modification. And for me, it was important not to be constipated or to have, let's say, a bowel movement uh, in the morning. And then, so the main modification I did was avoid eating um, cheese. Um, you know, things like pizza and all, I didn't eat that at all. And because uh, and that, for me, tends to be constipating. 
So it was a few, you know, tricks like that. I think it can make it all very workable. Um, and then those few cases where my bladder was bursting or um, the, uh, the, the procedure or the radiation was delayed for whatever the reason, yeah, I, I could control and let out a little urine and, you know, still maintain a full volume that was sufficient. <clears throat> so anyway, that's just some tips. Thank you for the tips. Mark, right, right. Uh, real quickly, this is Joe Gallo. I had uh, IMRT earlier this year. Um, I had 23 sessions. <clears throat> the um, it, they use a couple, two different, or they use a couple different uh, variations for for aligning the radiation. Uh, in some cases, they in, insert what they call fiducials, little gold pieces. I didn't have that. What I had is they used on the on the equipment itself. It was basically like a mini CRT, um, mini uh, mini mini CT rather. And um, what they do is you have a session that they call a planning session. And I they just bring did them. that. I just did okay. that. All right. So so the question you want to just find out is, I mean, neither one's going to matter that much for you, but you can find out how they're going to do the alignment. So what they did in each case when I got onto the table, um, they had, believe it or not, it was almost like magic marker spots that they used to do the broad alignment. And then the unit came in and they actually used the CT to do the final alignment. Yeah. They is, did. Um, jo Joe, M Mark is getting true beam variant. Is that what you got? Uh, I'm not sure what they called it. That's the name. That's the equipment. Yeah, I think it's probably the same one that you're getting. We've, we've. That's what I, I got. Who, Rick, that's who, who what got I got. That? Oh, Julian, that's what you got? Yes, sir. And, yeah, they did, and? They, they called it the VMAT in my case. I don't know why they called it VMAT, but it's a version of I, uh, IMRT. Right. And I had 23 sessions because I did a uh, one-day high-dose radiation brachytherapy boost. Right. That cut it down from 39 to 23. But everything else the guys have said about having a clean rectum and having a, uh, a full bladder is, is head on. Right, right. Yeah, I had the same. I had the the, the breaky boost too as well. Yeah. yeah. I want so to say Mark, one thing. you can I say one thing? Yes, go ahead, Jimmy. Uh, they, I found that the uh, instruction to do it, you, you employ a low fiber diet, didn't work well for me because they wanted an empty bladder, but I got so constipated because I was so unaccustomed. To a low fiber diet and i told them they said well just go back to your regular diet and we'll see if it works out and it did so that was my experience with the diet part hey mark you got you got all we can put you in touch with any and all of these guys and like i just put in the chat window you ain't gonna hear this stuff anywhere else i mean it's amazing it's amazing you guys are brilliant um some of these tips are you just you certainly ain't going to get them from your doctor. I mean, Mark and I worked last week to pull out information on sexual dysfunction and to pull out information on on uh, incontinence. I mean, they didn't even offer it. And this is MSKCC. I mean, it was ridiculous. It was only because Mark went back to them with questions that I was feeding him that we got some good information. So thank you, everybody. Rick, can thank I you so much. Add could I just add one thing about the oxycodone? Please. Um, have they, if they've not told you, you should be aware that it's highly constipating. And I, I was on it for a while. I finally gave up because I had such a hard time. Um, dealing with the constipation, but you should probably uh, be ready to start taking a stool softener and a laxative very soon because for a lot of people, it's highly constipating. Yeah, that, that's great advice. Great advice, Gary. It's also- and I know that Jake will endorse that. He's, it's given him a lot of problems. 
it's dose when dependent. So he's only doing two and a half milligrams. Watch your dose. If your dose starts to escalate, be honest about that. Did you bring that? If you escalate the dose, then you're going to have more constipation and the possible of the, the, the dependency. And you're starting at two and a half, which is very low. So that's good. Keep it mm -hmm. as low as you can, I would say. There are th two things you can take for the constipation. I uh, When I had my knee done, I had the Kaiser gave me, of course, something not not quite oxycontin, but uh, they well, gave me the same constipation. And I two Senna pills, S E N N A, and Clearlax. You just use the capful. Just doing those two things, I had absolutely no problems. And any other time I had to take it before, I was miserable because of it. But two Senna pills and the, a Clearlax every night, and it I had never had a problem in constipation yeah that's excellent okay. advice guys what gary and what jeff both said um if you let it get out of hand you become impacted and that becomes an issue in itself i actually went eight days um before i could actually do anything i ended up having to pull it out with my hands um so definitely stay on top of it don't don't wait to get constipated try to you know even eat prunes um just something to keep things moving and soft it was actually as I did. <laughs> Just one yeah, more thing to occur to me. More. There's evidence that uh, THC will uh, enable most patients to take uh, to manage the cancer pain with with lower doses of opiates. So I'll talk to you, Doc, about that. Okay. The uh, Rick. The other thing that worked for me is Bob Smith. Uh, for the opioid constipation was Metamucil. I quit taking all the softeners and Senna's and all that stuff, and that's worked better. And uh, just thought I'd pass that on. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Len, I think you got to. We got to move along. Yeah. Now, Rick, uh, because I, <laughs> I had to reboot my computer, I didn't get through asking everyone if they needed time. Should I do that now or should we go to Steve Barber? Well, you, you, I would go to Steve Barber and then we can run through everybody when we're done with Steve Barber. And Bill Lewis, if you'll accept our apologies and maybe you can give your history, um, God willing, next week. We're here every week, um, but we, as you can see, we've got, a, got quite a few people and we've got a, already um, a few new people so go go ahead no problem. that's fine thank you okay steve are you ready yes i'll try to be brief can you hear me all right yeah i'm going to ask you some questions steve and you just to answer them as they come up okay no problem so tell us how old you are i'm 75 i'll be 76 in june all right and where do you live i think you told us but I live in an area called Granite Bay, which is between uh, Roseville and Auburn, outside of Sacramento to the east, right. Sacramento, California. Right. Okay. And uh, let's see, when were you first diagnosed? Well, I have two stories to tell. My original bout with prostate cancer was in uh, 1999. Uh, it resulted in a radical prostatectomy. I was... Um, I don't know my Gleason scores, but I was PSA clear like 0 0.01 and point uh, uh, for a better part of 20 years. And a couple years ago, uh, during a routine, not routine situation, uh, my scores jumped from uh, 0 0.01 to 4 to 10 to 17. And uh, the coincidence was with a bump on my head that hurt. And I self-diagnosed as my cancer was back. Um, so my original um, situation uh, back in the day, 20 some, 24 years, 23 years ago now, um, <clears throat> resulted, as I said, in a radical prostatectomy. Uh, unhappily, I was only six months short of the um, Robots showing up on the market. I have a very good friend who was number 22 getting the robot surgery. I wish I'd had it. Um, anyway, aside from the details, I'm now coping with um, 
uh, prostate cancer to the skull and uh, using chemotherapy, which is working miraculously. Uh, my purpose here is to um, learn more about how to diagnose and what to expect as the cancer progresses. My so score, my score, on, go ahead, sorry. Are you on docetaxel right now? Uh, I've got three drugs uh, going on at the same time. One is Lupron. The other one is the brand name or the name of it is, I don't know the pharmacological name, but uh, the other one is uh, something called Extandi. Right. And the third one is Exchiva. I know what they do, but I don't know what the pharmacological names are. That's all right. That's fine. Um, okay. So those are hormone drugs and bone strengthening drugs, but the chemo is docetaxel. Is that right? Uh, what do you, what do you, what do you mean docetaxel? What is that? Okay. Maybe uh, we're misunderstanding. I don't, think, I don't think he's getting chemo. You don't think he's getting chemo? Right. Okay. So you, when you referred to chemo, you said you're getting chemotherapy, but you were talking about the Lupron and the Xtandi and the Xtiva. Is that right? Those are the three drugs that I'm receiving at this time. I, I thought that that was called chemotherapy. No, no, no. That's all right. right. Okay. So, uh, what was your latest PSA? Uh, point zero nine negligible. Point. Zero. And it's been that way since the Lupron. Well, that's good. And they still uh, never told you what your Gleason score was. Well, I'm sure they told me, but uh, I don't pay any attention to that because... Okay. We're thinking about the, uh, the uh, met in your skull. Are they going to spot radiate that? No, the um, uh, radiological oncologist suggested it was too close to my brain. It had not penetrated the mylar sheath. So he sent me over to the oncologist who specializes in chemicals. And that's who I've been working with for the past two years. So there's not been any kind of radiation therapy. The uh, diminution of the bump in the skull and the pain uh, virtually disappeared with the Lupron uh, and has stayed away since then. But I've had other weird symptoms that I'm hoping some of the group can help me with uh, with regard to other pain in the back of my neck and uh, the bottom of my skull. Uh, Steve, when were you last scanned? Like CT, MRI? Uh, well, at the time, at the time to confirm the bump in the head was uh, prostate cancer was uh, two years ago. The last time I had a CT scan, but not an MRI was just a couple weeks ago. Uh, what they found, and that was because of pain in my neck and uh, similar pain in my uh, lymph glands that I had when the bump occurred originally. Uh, the, the lymph glands didn't swell, but they hurt. And that pain went away almost immediately and the skull, the bump in the skull disappeared. Um, the same kind of thing was happening with this pain in the back of my neck and in the, in the side muscles of my neck. Um, that pain went away uh, a few days before the uh, CT scan, but the CT scan revealed a uh, uh, what the report said was a thickening of uh, the medial fold at the back of my throat and um, the generation of the um, cervical uh, vertebrae and that's about it it didn't reveal the ct scan did not reveal any other uh, um, abnormalities steve who is your oncologist uh, a man named dr siva kumar reddy he's with um, sutter medical in roseville california yeah Okay. Do you know if he is a genital urinary specialist? I can find out. I'll bet Herb will beat you to it. <laughs> uh, uh, the other, I, 
Was there uh, any genetic testing done, Steve? No. My parents both passed away at an early age. My father died of an airplane crash after um, having experienced heart disease, which he died at the age of uh, 57 or 55. My mother died at the age of 65. Uh, from uh, Alzheimer's disease, but there's been no real history of cancer in my family. Okay. He is not, he's not a GU medonc. Okay, so what we do on this call, Steve, is we always recommend that guys see a medical oncologist who specializes in genital urinary practice, which is the prostate, the bladder, test, testes, uh, you know, just that area, because it's just too much to try and keep up with for any oncologist, if they're just a general oncologist and they're treating all kinds of cancer patients. So I don't know, maybe Rick knows somebody up there in that area who's a GU specialist. Yeah. So I'm uh, going to give you one really good example. Um, a GU medical oncologist would have ordered a PSMA scan or at least an Axiomin scan for you just recently, rather than a general scan, a general uh, CT scan. Um, these are more specialized scans, and if you're not a GU medonc, you don't necessarily think of them. What was um, the other one? You said Maxumin, and what was the other one? Axumin, A X U M I N, A X U M I N, Axumin. Somebody will yeah. put it in the chat window. And the other one would be a PSMA scan. P is in Peter, uh -huh. S is in sugar, M A. I heard um, that reference in the earlier conversation, yes. Right. And you either Pilarify, which is made by Lanthius, which is going to be available probably in the San Diego, in the um, Sacramento area, or you could you could run down um, and get one at UCSF. Um, in terms of where to find um, the best doc for you, um, UCS, uh, UC Davis is expanding its Genito urinary medical practice. They have a couple of guys there. Um, they're okay, but they're not the best. I mean, if it were me and your insurance covered it, I'd take the extra hour and a half, make sure you book a time in the middle of the day and go down to Mission Bay to UCSF because you're not going to get much better care anywhere on the on the west coast um you'll get as good care but probably not better who would i see there um probably either rahul agawal a-g-g-a-r-w-a-l um hala borno she's really she seems i don't know her personally but she seems really nice B-O-R-N-O, Halla, H-A-L-A, she's smart. Um, the other guy, um, he does a lot of bladder cancer work, but he also does prostate cancer work, and he's terrific, is Terry Friedlander, F-R-I-E-D-L-A-N-D-E-R. -E um, I'd say whoever you could get into first of those three. Um, but really, you know, we, we need to step up. We need to know where are all, where's all the metastasis, um, the problem you're going to have right now in terms of these scans, to be honest, is that at 0 0.09, which is what you said your most recent PSA is, is that right? Yes. You're not going to have a lot show. So, you know, I, I, I guess in a sense, Reddy might, might, might be correct because he's going to say, well, there's no point in doing one of these scans because when you're when you're less than 0.5 we're not going to see anything um at the same time um if it were me i'd be much more comfortable with a gu medical oncologist as my quarterback i think and and a lot of times they'll work with the local they will work with local people so you know you you may be able to bring keep ready in place 
get a second opinion from one of these guys and then have them there ready to bring into your team when you need them as a strategy. All right, understood. Steve, how do you manage the pain that you say you've had in different areas? Uh, the only pain that I've had in the skull has come on lately, which is the stiff neck business. Uh, and there's occasionally some pain at the site of where the prostate used to be, but that could easily be uh, uh, kidney stones. Um, mm. And it comes and goes. Like right now, I'm pain-free everywhere. Uh, there's been okay. no pain at the site of the bump on my skull, which was toward the rear, um, since the Lupron. So um, I don't really have any let's, pain. Um, let, let's, let's bring in Joe Blanchett just for a second, because he's kind of the expert. of uh, He's the pain in the neck expert, as we say. Joe? <laughs> yes, I currently, for the past year, have had a pain in my right neck because I do have prostate cancer in my right neck based on a PSMA PET scan that I took a couple of months back. Um, and uh, I'm going to be receiving SBRT for that cancer. Um, I do have a little information. I have a man, I'm also a US2 um, prostate cancer support group leader. And one of my men who do have who does have prostate cancer in my, in the brain and on on the head bone and all over his back and um uh, i i uh, asked uh, my radiation oncologist about that he I says have you seen these uh, cases he says yes he says and he says it's really not in the brain but it's in the fluid in between the uh, head bone and the brain and Eddie says, SBRT takes care of that uh, real easy. He says, it's unbelievable. It's just like magic when I put SBRT uh, on, the, uh, on the head bone mm -hmm. and on the, uh, in that fluid between the head bone and the brain. So and he what, was, is, what is SBRT? It's a form of radiation that's delivered by a cyber knife machine or a, a modified cyber knife machine. And, um, and so it's very accurate and they can take care of cancers any place in the bone in your body, as far as I can tell, or even on soft tissue. But uh, um, cyber knife is usually used on soft tissue that moves like the rectum, the bladder, the prostate, and, uh, uh, so, uh, but the, uh, uh, on the East Coast, it's called the true beam machine, which is good for static um, prostate cancer on the bone, where they can immobilize your head or immobilize your hips and radiate that uh, radiates you to the bone, so they they know that's an accurate placement of the beam. So um, that's what it is. Okay, thank you. So another another thing you might want to look into, and that's a little bit controversial, is proton beam radiation, because that's what proton is really specialized in is going to the brain. They they do a lot of pediatric. Uh, proton beam with children because their brains are developing and proton can be, you know, hits the target and doesn't do, um, doesn't go beyond the target. So if it was me, I'd, I'd explore that option. Uh, you might want to talk, talk to the radiation oncologist at UCSF about something like that um, because it's, it's so specific. All right. Thank you. I appreciate all this information. Good suggestion, Peter. Yeah, I like that. All right. Can we move second on? What Peter, I would second what Peter said. Uh, Len? What was that? I would second what Peter said. Yeah. On proton beam? Yeah. I uh, had my prostate, my prostate bed uh, ablated by proton radiation. And uh, I did it just because of what Peter said. It only goes to the source that they're trying to radiogra radiograph, if you will, or destroy, and it doesn't go beyond that. So it might be just uh, Google it. All right, thank you. Um, Steve, do we have your um, email address? Can we? 
add you to the database so that you get a notice about these meetings? Uh, no, I, I just came on to this uh, uh, meeting this afternoon. I'm not certain how to uh, register, which is what you talked about. Where would I give you my email address? Just, um, can, can you use the chat window? Yes, I can. Just put it in there. You can send it to one the organizers or to one of us, to me, and we'll make sure you get entered and you'll get a reminder before each meeting. And I just so, want to tell everybody on the reminder, we broke a record this week. Uh, we had more than 50% of the people that received the reminder open it, which is um, fantastic. So just saying. Well, that's, there was because of the new logo. that's because the new logo ben did a good oh, that, job <laughs> that yeah and len and because len wrote such a great piece on enzalutamide and up and uh, abiraterone mm -hmm. all, all right, right. got it I thanks sent, steve i sent the email address to the organizers i got it i've got it thank you i'd like to uh, continue polling people to see if they need time tonight. Uh, I think, Jay, did you need any time, Jay Mills? I'll, I will say that I'm still uh, undetectable and that's all the time I need. So Perfect. I'm, I'm... That's great, Jay. Thanks. I'm glad to hear it. Uh, Gary Peters, I don't think I asked you. Uh, no, thanks, Len. Okay. Uh, Russell? Russell Hoover. Nothing for me tonight, thank you. All right, Joel, how about you, Joel Blanchett? Yeah, uh, nothing tonight, uh, Len, appreciate it. Okay, and Jimmy Greenfield? Yes, I have a small matter. All righty. And how about you, Jerry, Jerry Pelfrey? I'm on. Uh, I'm fine, Len. Thank you very much. Okay, glad to hear it. Uh, Dennis, did I ask you? Or I think I did, right? You said no. Okay. Uh, Carl Van Z, you like time tonight? Yeah, I had a question for the group. Okay. All right, let's see who else. Um, Alan Moskowitz? Uh, no, nothing for me tonight. Okay, Alan. Dennis McGuire? Hi, Len. Uh, nothing tonight. Okay, Dennis. Dennis, uh, when, do they, when do you get in that chair? When do you get in that uh, chair for your first lutetium? Oh, it was uh, December 9th. Okay. Yeah, so I, I actually get some blood work done later this week. So we'll get some indication. Okay. Great. Okay. okay. Good luck with that. Carl, Carl Foreman. Uh, not tonight, thanks. Okay. Julian. Uh, just a quick update. Uh, PSA is still undetectable. Steady as she goes. Oh, very good. Glad to hear it. How about you, Vic? Not tonight, Len. Thank you, though. Okay. Stan Friedman. You need time, Stan. Well, maybe he stepped away. I had him. I had him muted, uh, Stan, uh, Len, because he was making noise. Oh. He needs, to, <laughs> needs to unmute himself. There he goes. Thank you. Uh, no, thank you, Len. Uh, still undetectable. Terrific. Thank you. Jim Marshall, did we hear from you yet? Yes, and negative. Okay. <laughs> and Don Price? No, oh, Len, I'm good. Thanks. Thank you, Don. Uh, I think I, I didn't hit on Mike Phillips. How are you doing, Mike? 
Well, I'm doing pretty good, and I, I have a little update that I can give when there's time. Okay. Is there anyone else I didn't call on who would like some time? Oh, Bob Smith. Uh, yeah, I know. I got you already, Bob. Did you Let, get to Nathanson? Why don't we start with you? Go ahead, Bob. Um, first of all, thank you to this group. It's been very helpful, and especially to my uh, fellow Hawaiian resident, Peter Kafka. So he's very helpful. <clears throat> Can you hear me? Yes. Earlier, someone said that he couldn't hear me. Um, update uh, diagnosed in late 18, prostatectomy, lymphonectomy. Uh, some time on the Lupron, of course, it worked pretty well initially. Uh, about the last six months on abiraterone, uh, prednisone, and the Lupron continuing. Uh, latest, my, my PSA has been shooting up pretty fast. The latest uh, from 10, uh, one month later, 14. Uh, the, perhaps the good news is that uh, my last uh, CT and bone scan back in October, nothing on the CT, noteworthy, and the uh, METs, I had a couple of METs, they had I had some areas that, that were fracture healings, and they thought those might be METs, but they weren't. Anyway, uh, pretty stable. So that's where I am. I'm going in January for another bone scan, CT, and uh, then they'll consider where else to go. They mentioned maybe radium-223. I was also interested in the, the BAT uh, to enzalutamide, since I'm on the abiraterone now. Right. Yes, that's that's what uh, that's the posting Jake the, the article Jake pulled up actually. Yes. Uh, where the sequence males favors abiraterone and then bat therapy and then enzalutamide. Uh -huh. So they certainly talk to your doctor about that. But I wouldn't say your condition is stable, uh, Bob. If your PSA jumps like forty percent in one month. So, you know, if those scans don't pick up anything, make sure you get a, a more sensitive scan like Axiomen or Polarify, which you've heard us talk about earlier. Okay. Okay. Bob, Bob, are you still seeing the, the young uh, oncologist who comes over from Maui? Oh, uh, they had a, a, I live in Kona, Hawaii, and right. they had a whole lot of patients with cancer, not necessarily prostate here. So the, both the Maui docs were, have been filling in, but I usually, I've never talked to them in person. Uh, now they have one MD onc who's, who comes over from Honolulu. And then uh, thanks to you and others, uh, I also, every time after I get a scan or a CT, I also talk to or consult with uh, Andrea Harstark, which was highly recommend, who was highly recommended. So that's uh, my stable of oncologists, and she's the GU oncologist. Good. You know, you want to stick with her. Um, yeah, they don't have Polarify here in the islands yet. I just checked the other day. Uh, my oncologist wanted me to look into it, and, they, and I talked to them, and they don't have it. So um, it's it's either Oximin or, or nothing, I guess. And you got to go to Honolulu probably for that. Um, so it's a, it's a lot of humbug here in terms of you know, getting good good scans and stuff. Um, I don't think they even have it there. Huh? I don't think they even have it in Honolulu. Yeah, probably not. I, I don't know. It's it's yeah. kind of weird over here. You know, and I don't know whether you're up to flying to you know, Oakland or something like that and doing something um, there. But well, maybe uh, the VA in LA, I think they, yeah. they had it for a while. I don't know if they still do. Right. So, they were doing uh, the files. I don't know what the, the status of that is. Yeah. The VA in Los Angeles, I think, is still offering a PSMA scan. 
The person who would know is Joe Gallo. And I, if you're eligible for the VA, um, then send Joe a note and ask him. He'll be right on top of that. He even knows the doctor that's running the trial. Joe is at Joe G at ancan.org. Joe G at ancan.org and send him a note. Um, Bob, are you on any time? What are you on hormone therapy right now? I, I don't have anything in my notes. Am I on what kind of therapy? What, 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 drugs yes. are you, what, what drugs are you taking right now? Okay, I'm in a, in, kind of in the middle of a six month uh, Lupron shot. Okay. And I'm also on Abiraterone, okay. uh, which I've been on that for about six months. Okay. And that's it, except for the prednisone. Right. So, a couple of things I would definitely suggest to you. Um, especially since your your PSA is going up now, I would request um, Provenge sooner rather than later. You're eligible for it. You should be able to get it. Um, it is um, it's proven to be very, very helpful. You won't see it, but the life expectancy of men who get Provenge early enough in the disease process is significant and you need to be proactive to get it and 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 you can get it through kaiser um and you need and you should if it were me i would want it now um these these three rises these rises in your psa make you make you eligible the second thing i would um want to do um as we've discussed is to get a better scan and the third thing i would want to do is to write to dr hartstark and say what are we doing what 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 are we going to go to next because clearly the abbey is not is not holding me because as len said this this is not stable and to go from 10 to 14 in a short period of time means that your treatment you're due to change treatment yeah, that, so that's those are three action items. Okay. Can I interrupt and add a comment? Sure. Go ahead, Bill. Um, I have an article that says that men who had been taking Zytiga, the abiraterone, and doing it the classic way of doing it fasting and switched to doing it with a meal, which means you get a lot more in your bloodstream, uh, a number of them, I forget the exact percentage, had had a uh, significantly improved result, and uh, that's something you could start tomorrow. If, uh, oh, if oh, oh, the article. Oh, oh, hold on, hold on a minute, Bill. I mean, <laughs> I don't know that we want to be to be saying that without him first consulting with his medical oncologist. Number one. Secondly, um, if you're talking the same dose then that is the equivalent of increasing the amount of abiraterone he's taking by four times. Yep, so four I think we have, to, we have to be really, really careful with that. Um, I think that you can you can talk about it, but I, I've, what I have not heard of is increasing the amount of abiraterone in your system to combat the disease, which is essentially yeah. the same thing as taking it with with um, meals and I, before we go back to Bill and we will come back to you, Bill, I, I'd like to hear from Len and Herb on this. I, I haven't okay. heard anything at all about increasing the dose of abiraterone improving uh, or overcoming resistance to abiraterone. Herb, have you? I mean, abiraterone, the mechanism of abiraterone is it is an irreversible enzyme inhibitor, okay? So if you irreversibly inhibit that enzyme, adding more abiraterone isn't gonna make any difference because it's already dead, number one. Number two, increasing blood levels of abiraterone are a trigger for hepatic liver problem. That's why you need to have your liver enzymes measured while you're on abiraterone. And I think 
higher dose of abiraterone can trigger that. And number three, at least I have not seen any published data that shows any increase in survival, progression-free survival, or overall survival based on the abiraterone with food regimen. And in fact, I tried to contact the doc who published it to ask what could, to, to, to prod him to do a trial. But right now there's no data that supports the food regimen being any better than a standard regimen. Bob, what is your T level, your testosterone level? Do you know? No. I imagine it's pretty low, but I don't know. Yeah. And so that's, you know, abiraterone is not going to help if your T levels are already in single digits. I mean, you can't get much lower than that. So it's just doesn't seem to be a good idea, but feel free to talk it over with your doc. Okay, plus I'm on the Lupron, as I mentioned. Uh, but I, I have a question. Uh, most of your comments have pertained to my uh, rapid PSA rise. Uh, how significant is it that the bone scan looks between October, excuse me, between, uh, I think it was June or April and in, in October, uh, was pretty steady. Uh, I had three METs, uh, not counting all the... <laughs> my healing bicycle accident fractures. And <clears throat> so it, that's been pretty steady. Is that a significant? Yeah, so, so let me respond to that. Um, it may well be that the, the scan that they're using isn't sensitive enough to pick up the, the, the metastasis. Um, so I would say that what, what you really need to be comparing um, is with a better form of scanning than the C11. That's the first thing. The second thing is, when are you due for another Lupron shot? Three months. Uh, I think it was, yeah, I think it's about three months. Yeah. So you got three months in. Um, no, well then that, that shoots my theory. Um, we, we don't recommend, again, we, we try not to give medical advice, but we've seen that six month shots tend not to work so well at the back end oh. so but you're not at the back end of the medical i was thinking oh maybe you're in your fifth month or something and it no. isn't working but that but that's not it and by and large it's better to get um not to go out beyond four months from our experience so, rather than the so six rick, months short rick yeah. let me bring this up i did read a paper where they looked at people who were on Lupron and other hormone drugs whose, T, who, whose PSA went up. And what they found when they looked carefully was that their testosterone had crept up. Yeah. So, okay? so it, Bill, do you know, have you had your, do they regularly measure your serum testosterone? No, I, yes. I've had it measured once, uh, but that was um, maybe even a year ago. When I was just on really? loop, and that how, was often, how often do you do your PSA? How often do you do a blood test? Um, I do uh, PSA and uh, a whole bunch of other blood tests for liver, uh, kidneys, so forth, uh, every month. Every month, good. Well, tell 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 Andrea or whoever I can would stick in the, t the testosterone every month. It's cheap. It's okay. No All right. What what a, one thing that Rick said. Uh, Rick, I wasn't saying that the, the bone scan wasn't picking up anything. It's picking up three uh, highly suspected meds, but they're they're not doing anything. They're not growing. Yeah, so, no. What I, what I'm saying is I understand that, but what I'm saying is that there could be more metastasis that it's not picking up. That, that okay. the scan doesn't see. All right. Because it's not it's not a detailed enough scan. I'm also really surprised they're not testing your uh, testosterone every month because the way that the, the way that Kaiser usually doles out its its Lupron is on the basis of your testosterone level, and they won't give you another testosterone shot if your uh, another Lupron shot if your testosterone is continues to be low. Now, 
that's certainly how they work in California, as as Jeff Marchi will vouch. And and I was a I was a Kaiser patient in California. So, I cannot uh, confirm that. I did not have that experience. They oh, uh, me, did me. not. They have not tested my testosterone unless I've asked for it for two and a half years, and I get my Lupron shot regularly. Oh, well, they, they, they've obviously gone to a different system since I got Lupron at Kaiser then. <laughs> Maybe it's Harstark. Harstark. Might Harstark. be Harstark. Harstark hasn't mentioned it. No, well, that's why you have the same doctor. Yeah. She's very I thorough. Bring, bring it up to her. And also, yeah. Rick's suggestion of Provenge, you might want to discuss that with her. Because okay. that's, an, that's another humbug about living in the Outer Islands. You know, I, I looked at Provenge, you got, I would have to fly to Honolulu twice a week for three weeks because you can't get it on the outer islands because oh. of the, of the uh, reliability of air travel. You know, they got to get the blood back to the West Coast fast uh, and they won't do it on the outer islands. So, it's, um, I mean, it's, it's crazy, but that's the, uh, the handicap that we live with. But maybe a three week trip to, to California might uh might be the answer do all, everything so, at once so is provenge a one-shot thing that no it's, it's, it's three blood draws a week apart and then and then reins, reinsertion of the uh of your blood at the end of the week so it's a monday thursday type of deal oh okay two trips, two trips a week to honolulu it's it's a lot of humbug yeah okay thank you that's all I have. Christmas Carol this season, Peter. <laughs> What's that? Did you watch a Christmas Carol this Christmas season? You, That's you, right. Ah, ah, humbug. Ah, humbug. They've, they've forgotten us over here in the Outer Islands. <laughs> all right. Uh, let us go on to Jeff Markey, who had a question about prednisone, dexamethasone. Well, I, 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 I went to Har Stark and said. And gave her the uh, article that somebody posted last week. And one of the big things are the numbers for radiographic progression-free survival, which means how long before you start to grow again. If you take dexamethasone, it's 26.6 months. With prednisone taken twice daily, 5 milligrams, it's 18 and a half months. Prednisone, 5 milligrams once daily is 15.3 months. That's what they say is... If you're going to have your metastasis start to grow again, those are the number of months. Now, so I, I asked her to start to switch. She immediately did it for me. Um, I took dexamethasone for two days. And this uh, yesterday morning for the third day I took it. And I didn't feel right about 45 minutes later. I just did not feel right. And I took my blood pressure cuff out and uh, checked. I, I, I tried to check my pulse and I couldn't. It wasn't there to check uh, in, a, in a, any any normal mode, and I so I pulled out my you know, blood pressure, which also does pulse, and my blood pressure was 171 over 111, and my pulse was 130, and I had AFib for sure. I'd had it 15 years ago, or you know, it's, you just, I had it for two and a half days one time, and uh, I, I I took Ativan. Which I've, I've been to the hospital for it. They give you Ativan. They give you, give you a, oh, shoot. Um, well, what is it? Oh, yeah, Diltiazin. And uh, so I took uh, Ativan and Diltiazin. My blood pressure went down to normal. But uh, AFib wouldn't go away. This morning I wake up. I check. I'm, I'm at 130. Uh, I, uh, I tried to do my pulse, but it is bump, bump, bump. Bum, 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 nothing, bump, bump, nothing, bump, 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 and so it's impossible to calculate. So I call Heiser, Kaiser, and uh, my doctor's office calls back and told me to go to ER. So I go to ER, I walk into ER, wait about five minutes, sit down at a desk to have my blood pressure taken, and my pulse is normal. So I'm not taking dexamethasone anymore, but uh, just a warning. Uh, one other thing, my hot flashes have reduced to, well, I haven't had any for four days now. Uh, last week, I had four straight days without any, and then one one day, two one day, six one day. The interesting thing about that was I had to use the devices six times, and they sort of retrained my body, and I went back to zero. 
Um, wearing two of them has been incredible. I, I just, I, I was getting, I when I started the device, I was getting 100 hot flashes a week, one week and 97 the other. Within two weeks, um, the maximum I ever hit again was 96. And I mean, it's literally zero right now, it seems. I don't have to say anything more. Um, just death of Mexico's zone may not be the best for you. Yeah, well, you, you accurately quoted the benefits of dexamethasone, uh, Jeff, but you must have overlooked the fact that it did say there would be more side effects with dexamethasone, and you're experiencing them. So, yeah, you should go back to uh, prednisone. For, two extra, for one extra year of non-radiographic change, it was worth trying. Yeah, don't forget those are just... Uh, Median values, you know, your your mileage may vary. Well, okay. Uh, how about we go to Jimmy Greenfield? Okay. Hello. Hello. So uh, I know I've got a problem that is quite common, and I don't think of it as particularly severe, but I still seek the uh, experience. A lot of us. Uh, when we get older anyway, get up frequently in the night to pee. And this is expected, and of course, after the scorched earth of my uh, lower area, then I expect this would be a, a lifelong thing, and it is. But I have tried uh, now three different drugs for nighttime frequency, and it is frequency. I mean, there is, I do pee when I get up. Basically, I go to bed, I get up about an hour to 90 minutes later the first time, another hour to 90 minutes later the second time. Then I get about two hours, uh, if I'm lucky, two and a half hours twice after that. And now I'm pretty much done sleeping. Um, I know I can't go back to how it was when I was 19 when I drink tequila all night and then sleep from 4 a.m. to 1 p.m. in the afternoon and then pee for two minutes straight with a stream that could knock over a small animal. Those days are gone, obviously. And will never to return. But I have tried imipramine, I've tried oxybutynin, and something called uh, solifanacin. And all three of those drugs had a similar effect, which is that they didn't really work and they caused me to be constipated. I can fight the constipation, but the uh, imipramine in particular, or no, it was the oxybutynin. My RO uh, recommended me, uh, prescribed me. And when it wasn't working very well, I said, just go ahead and double the dose and see what happens. So I doubled the dose and that just made me more constipated and it did not seem to help. So I've tried, you know, not having coffee late, obviously, you know, any, any caffeinated beverages. I've tried cutting back on my, my fluids in the late in the evening in general. And I've tried uh, not eating late at night, although that's very hard for me because I enjoy that. So if anybody has got any, uh, any uh, answers, anything that's worked for them, or does everybody just get up every couple hours to pee? It's hard to believe that that's what we do. But you don't have to get up. Me. Get right. those bottles. <laughs> oh, get no, those no, bottles no. made for peeing into. I, when, I, when I had my knee done and couldn't get up, they worked great. Three sorry, of them Jeff. were. I'm sorry, Jeff, to cut you off, but that's, that's a bridge too far from me. I would actually rather get up as often as I do than to have any bottles going off the side of the bed. And that's just me, but I do appreciate it. Jimmy, you and I are on the same schedule. And, you know, I don't know what I can, I didn't try to do anything about it. All I do is just get up and pee and go back to sleep. I you think, are a miracle man. You've made I mean, me feel so much better. That's what I do, Herb. And Jimmy, it's the same with me. I mean, you just described what for the last two years. You know, it's right. not going away. Who's that who's talking to me? Jerry Pelfrey. Oh, Jerry. Jerry okay. Pelfrey. Well, Jerry, you yeah, thank you too. See, I feel better already. There's no solution. But, but Jimmy, so let me ask the question. Is it that you can't fall asleep again after you pee? No, I'm expert at that. So then there's no issue. You just get up, pee, go back to sleep. I find I get better dreams. Each time I get back into a REM episode, after I get back to 
sleeping, I give another dream, and it's they, better they over, than before. I think you oversold it. I don't, th I don't think I'm. I don't think I'm not can play at your level, but I do go back and sleep <laughs> fairly okay. But I, I mean, guys, I feel like it's interrupting my REM sleep, which it might not. Guys, guys, I don't let, think it is. Let me, let me let me come in here just a moment. Um, it's not great to have interrupted sleep like that. It creates a lot more fatigue, and so. Um, and we've known over the years that there are drugs. Um, some people take do well with Tamsulosin, Flomax. Um, Mobetric is another one. Carl Van, Cal Van Zee is sticking his thumb up. And, and I, I'd like to know if anyone here um, has um, had luck taking drugs and that have reduced the number of times they have to pee at, pee at night. I, Jimmy, I can tell you that for me, it was more insomnia from the prednisone. And uh, when I was traveling, uh, I took a wilderness canoe trip with my son and uh, I got in my sleeping bag about nine o'clock at night and I'd wake up a couple times during the night and it was fucking cold. And I just did not get up. And I just, you know, when I'm home and it's convenient, um, I get up. You know, it helps me kind of reset and go back to sleep. But getting off the prednisone was a big deal for me. You know, I was uh, just like you, you know, hour and a half, couple hours, boom, awake, you know. And yes, I had to pee. Um, but, you know, somehow, uh when i'm in a place where uh it's not convenient to get up like it's really cold and i've got to put on a bunch of gear and get out of my bag and you know or i'm i'm, I'm out fishing with a bunch of bunch of guys you know um somehow i've trained my brain to just roll over and go back to sleep i i can't really explain it okay well, thank you. Even more more uh, messages are coming in the chat window. And I, I know it's hokey, but when five or six guys say, well, I'm the same as you, then I feel better, you know, because I'm searching around for different drugs. Maybe I'll go for Flomax. Maybe I'll try one of the other ones. The drugs that I've tried all have the same uh, supposed action, which is to relax the bladder. But I don't find there's really any difference. And uh, I do get constipated. Yeah, you're not you're not alone in this, Jimmy. I've been doing this for years and years. It, sometimes it's frustrating, and sometimes, as Herb said, your dreams get enhanced. So I just live with it. No big so, deal. I, you know, when I when I I yeah, led with the idea it was a low grade problem, and now it feels like it's even lower grade. So I'm out of here. Let's move on to somebody else. Well, wait a minute. I, you're talking but Jimmy, about the Flomax, other I... and I've been on Flomax for for two years. And I still get up during the night. So if there's some other drug that had worked better, let me know. I, I'm the wrong guy to ask. Everything I try just makes me constipated. All right. I don't. I don't drink much as a habit, but once in a while I'll have a glass of wine if there's company or celebration. And I find when I drink a glass of wine, I can go for three or four hours without getting up. I don't know how that works. I have taken a liking to CBD oil. It, it, it improves my sleep. Yeah. All right, thank I mean, you all. The other thing is, I mean, Jimmy, the other thing for me is I just don't have pressure to get up in the morning and get out of bed until I, I've had enough sleep. I'm the same way and, and very thankful for that. <laughs> so okay. guys, I've put, I've put a drug, um, in the chat window, uh, Mirbetric, Mirbigran yeah. is the um, generic name. And I've known people who find that that works quite a bit better than Tamsulosin, but it, it's likely to be a tier three drug. But um, but check it out, Mirbetric. I've tried it and it did help. Thanks, Thanks Liz, yeah. So some people who find that uh, Tamsulosin Flomax doesn't work. Do find that Mibetric has a different mechanism of action, which Herb could explain, but I cannot, mm -hmm. or Len could explain. But um, 
it's it's uh, it may work. Thank you all. All right, guys, <clears throat> we're going to move on. Jimmy, you got plenty of company. Don't feel so bad. I feel terrific. All right. We should do a camping trip together. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, how about a fly fishing? How about a fly fishing camping fly fishing. trip, Herb? Yeah. We, could, yeah. we could probably fill the river Let's up there. Let's go fly summer. fishing. Right. Frank Fabish, did I get to you? I can't recall. Frank Fabish, did you want time? Okay, I'm unmuted. Um, a couple things that I'm involved in right now. Um, Zero Cancer Group, I helped in lobbying the Congress, uh, Congress for a military bill that would establish a clinical pathway for the treatment of prostate cancer in the military, which there's been a big absence and uh, the treatment for it is all over the board and nothing that is uh, uh, that shows a protocol for treating a certain type of cancer. And there should be because I'll just share with you a couple numbers. One in five veterans will develop prostate cancer in their lifetime. Prostate cancer rates in the military are twice those of the general population. There's nearly 490,000 veterans being treated by uh, in the VA healthcare system, and I'm one I'm one of those 490, and 16,000 have metastatic prostate cancer. And I'm one of those 16,000. And we were lobbying for this bill and a small amount of money, about $11 million, to establish this type of treatment. And we, I've heard it through all of you uh, as, uh, as I've joined this, uh, uh, this, this support group, how important it is based upon what your prostate cancer is doing. So I just wanted to share that, and um, and many people are not familiar with how prominent it is in the military community. Of course, if somebody wants to do a study, the question is, is why? Uh, second thing, I have my first presentation that's coming up in February uh, with. Um, or Govix, and I'm going to be talking about my story down in um, Orlando, Florida, as well as my wife Gail is going to be speaking on the uh, caretaker yeah. side, the caregiver side. And I don't know yet the details, but I'll share it with you when I learn more about the group that we're going to be talking to again trying to get the message out of, of about prostate cancer now it is slanted towards orgovix but still i think it's very beneficial to get that word out um, i have my next next checkup on january the 4th this is my first three month checkup since i switched from a six week frequency so it's going to be uh, very interesting and maybe a, a little bit of anxiety on what readings I'm going to get on the 4th with my uh, PSA and my testosterone and the other important uh, blood information and tests. The last item, I've been down with sciatica for the last two weeks. And I'm trying to find something that will help me. And uh, finally, my VA uh, primary care doctor 
gave me a referral out of the VA to OSU hospital system, and I'm waiting to be seen uh, by somebody, a specialist there, but it's been extremely painful. It's in my lower back. I had an MRI, and the first time, uh, if somebody tells you that you can't have an MRI if you have a pacemaker, it's, uh, I found out otherwise uh, uh, that you can't. All they have to do is turn it to a safe mode and then do the MRI and it turn it back to the regular mode. But I had that MRI and they found a bulging disc in L2-3 that's doing all the damage with my sciatica. Nothing related to prostate, at least at this time. But um, I just wanted to share that information. Hello. Anybody want Joe? Do you Joe Gallo? You want to comment on the uh, on the vet stuff? Because I know you were just in a meeting and now you're back. Yeah, and they canceled it on me, but that's all right. Um, yeah, I, I I just made a note because I was going to try to get a hold of Frank and find out uh, get a little bit more about his background. I did I missed part of what he said. Um, I'm working with a group that is uh, called VPCA, the veterans, and um, they're doing a lot of stuff at the uh, upper level, at the congressional level and all, uh, driving forward on that. But we're also working on, a, on um, a, a group, it's called 50 Vets in 50 States, although we're gonna try to expand it to it'll be 175 so that we can get out and do an outreach to uh, the individual vets as well as to the local clinics, as well as hospitals on, um, improving the the overall care for vets so I, I can get you the uh the website to where you can you can register but you can also get a hold of me and i can try to uh to help you find your way through that and I, you said you were getting ready to go to a conference was that for the orgovics yes or orgovics okay I'm, I'm on that as well Frank, that's an amazing statistic that twi twice the number of guys who are vets are diagnosed with prostate cancer. I mean, I think the national average for men is one out of nine, and you're saying one out of five for the military vets? Yes. That, that's, uh, could, well, could that, that, that be due to the demographics? Deserves... Could that be due to the demographics of who's in the military? I don't know. I don't know, but it's worth... I mean, I bet you that minorities are overrepresented in the military. But that's but that's saying minorities are more prone to prostate cancer. They are, I mean, aren't they? It needs a study for sure. Uh, don't forget Agent Orange, guys. Mm. Um, they, they Agent Orange is age where it's prostate Agent Orange. Orange. Yeah, and there's, two, there's yeah. Two, two things. Agent Orange is one of them. The second thing is uh, the uh, burn pits in Iraq after the Iraq invasion. Uh, the third is that many of the veterans are exposed to various gases and other things that come in their, uh, in their career when the military, and it tends to show up with um, prostate cancer. Now, again, there's no studies linked to uh, what the connection is, but, uh, but it's important to know that. And uh, Joe uh, Gallo, the bill that they're talking about, the House version is H.R. 4880, mm -hmm. and, the, and the Senate version is 2720. That uh, last year they didn't ha have the have time to get it passed, and uh, there's been a lot of push to get it in before the end of the year this year. One in eight men get prostate cancer, not one in nine. You can check the statistics many places. 
Well, anybody who wants to get all that particular detail, I'd have to go pull it up out of the uh, the files. But uh, the, uh, the, the the our leader is Mike Crosby, otherwise called Bing Crosby, um, and and Bing has put together a uh, a full packet of information on the uh, the VA and uh, prostate cancer counts and and so forth. Uh, so you know, if anybody wants that, I'll be glad to share it with you. And um, the uh, Frank, are you are you registered with the VA? Yeah, yes, I'm registered with the uh, Agent Orange database. But, but you uh, haven't, and, they haven't they haven't adjudicated you yet to uh, being being di uh, disabled. Yes, it took it took six years, but yes. You're saying you are or are not yet? Did no, I, I am. Uh, and uh, and mine is 100% because of Agent Orange. Right, same as mine. Yeah, okay. okay we, I, just, I, just, I just like to say that, that um, you know, Frank, as I pointed out in the meeting, uh, in the uh, reminder was featured in the, um, in by zero and um so i'm sort of surprised that frank isn't tied into you that zero didn't tie him into to you and 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 bing crosby and and, and the group because the, the, the connection with zero has has uh lessened still exists um i think crosby is uh, you know charging off ahead and, and not wanting to be uh, constrained by zero, although we do interact with zero. So, uh, okay. but, but that's why, you know, if, if Frank, if you'll give me your email, I'll definitely send you the, oh. uh, the packet of information. It's basically a, a series of slides with all the information on it, and uh, we can get you looped in. And uh, where are you located? I'm in Columbus, Ohio. Okay, because because the uh, uh, the the objective i don't want to tie everybody up here but the objective is started off with having one at least one vet in each state that's where the 50 vets in 50 states came up with and now trying to expand that group to 175 uh, to be able to hit all of the major facilities in all of the u.s locations so uh, you know might, so might get I, you on the high list no i just put my so I just put my email in the chat window. I see it. Yep. I will. I'll okay, get something so off to you tonight. We'll um, we'll we'll connect you guys and and um, and I just want to say to Bill Lewis, um, Bill, we're already on it. These guys are looking at this study. Um, it's a puzzle, and I think what we need to do is find out a little more about the earlier treatment on the for these men it was a small study a very small study uh just 41 men and i think we need to find out a little bit more about uh what treatment they had and if the treatment was um was not the protocol before uh they went to a full abby dose with food so rick um, let me I, let me put in something so one thing I noticed is, yes, in about 16% of the men, PSA declined when they switched the food. However, more than that, testosterone declined in these men when they switched the food. So that means that they were using some kind of a protocol with Abby that did not completely reduce testosterone to undetectable levels which is what we do now yeah. so i don't think that that study has relevance to the kinds of therapy that we're getting right now right before the Michigan my question is does, does the uh link that i put in the chat does that show up in your recorded session when people see the recording can they get yes. to the chat yes because we we, we we post the chat, so it'll be it will be in the it will be in there um, both on YouTube and on our website. The link will be included. What what I do want to say, which is even more important, however, is that um, 
we always encourage people to run something like that past their medical team. That is the most important. We, you know, we, we, we do not suggest that somebody reads the study and then responds on the basis of what they read. Um, that it is really important. If you think that you might want to switch to all food because you like the idea of what this says, you got to talk it over with your doc. Don't just do it. That is, that's not medical advice. Um, that's just good patient advocacy and good navigation. So guys, before I turn uh, turn this over to Rick for a closeout, was there anyone who didn't have a chance to speak who said they wanted to raise your Mike hand? Phillips? Did, did I, Mike Phillips want to say something? Oh, uh, Carl well, did, Carl Van Zee, I know. Hi, Carl Van Zee, go ahead. Yeah, I, I just want to ask if anybody here has been through uh, back treatment. I think that I'm most likely going to start uh, docetaxel chemo next week. But uh, in our other support group, in Marty's support group out here in Seattle, um, uh, one of one of the retired doctors suggested that I talk to my oncologist about that. And I'm of two minds about talking to him about that because uh, I kind of feel like since I put off having chemo for almost two years, uh, and now it's kind of a prerequisite for the PSMA lutetium, I, I kind of feel like I need to just suck it up, you know, and um, and, and and do the chemo for for the five months. Uh, but I did want to ask whether somebody else right. uh, had taken bat therapy um, um, as a way to do something before they took chemo so i don't know if there's anybody on this call if not i can summarize our experience with bat is I have. Um... oh please go ahead bill yeah i had it i had that after chemo oh and i'd uh, be happy to talk with carl uh I, my email's in the chat what was your experience, um, Bill? How did it did you did it help? Did it hurt? What what was the what was the bottom line for you? Uh, the bottom line was that it did not seem to have a lot of effect, but I came away with a strong impression that my oncologist was, uh, dare I say, too timid in making the swap back and forth, uh, and so I have proposed to him a a much more radical approach. And he hasn't approved by doing it yet. Well, the the only um, the experience that we've seen here, Carl, is that it seems to have a temporary impact. I mean, we've known two or three guys that have tried it, and they've had some success during the period of time that they've been doing it. Uh, not huge success. It seems to have stopped their um, their disease progressing. One of the problems is that people that we know who have done it have done it, and they've been pretty advanced. So that might be an issue. It might be another one of these drugs that you need to do earlier in the process, as soon as you become castrate resistant, for example. Um, but what we've seen is um, it doesn't hurt that much, but um, it doesn't seem to help that much either. Now, Len just posted something, uh, sent us something or wrote something about using it in between abiraterone and enzalutamide. That's a bit above my pay grade. Len may want to comment on that, but that's kind of where, that's kind of our experience. Is that an article on the website? Well, it's was in the notice that Rick sent out for this meeting. So it's got the links there, so you can check it out there. Right, it's linked in, it's linked in, actually in the reminder. So just open the reminder and there's a live link in, in the reminder. Thank you. So uh, I, I'm, I apologize to Jake, I forgot. He wanted to tell us about his hospice experience. So Jake, please take the floor. Oh, okay. Well, I, I thought we could just wait till next week. 
Um, for, anyway, for if you if we have time. Anyway, for people that don't know, I've I've been on hospice care for the, like the last two weeks now. Um, I had a fall in the bathroom where I just collapsed, and I've basically been confined to my bed because my legs don't move, my legs won't work. Um, so I've been using the little urinal that Jimmy Green, uh, Jimmy doesn't want to use, and it's that's an experience in itself. <laughs> after eight, after eight years of ADT. Trying to get that little winker into the uh, the big hole, uh, <laughs> get get as much of myself as I do in the, in, the, in the bottle. But anyway, that's beside the point. Um, the hospice experience itself has been, I have to say, I've been impressed. Um, I know it depends on the state and it depends on the company that provides it. Um, but I've had, I probably in the last few days before Christmas and then since then. I've probably had more company from hospice than I had for two years prior to that, believe it or not. Um, I had an RN nurse come out two times. The first time when they did the initial uh, admissions, she spent two and a half hours sitting, sitting here talking to us, to me and my wife. And then we had a social worker come out, we had a chaplain come out, um, had a health aide come out. Um, and you know they basically they they want to do some things they do once a week, um, like the health aide will come out and, and like help you bathe, you know, give you a shampoo if you need one or whatever. Um, they'll do it up to three times a week, but we ask for just once. The RN comes out once a week and they check you, they check your vitals and renew your medicines or whatever, which is the thing that most people are interested in, I believe, is uh, you know palliative care versus hospice care and the definition. Um, it sounds like they're going to continue all of my medications with the exception of Zometa because they don't do, um, that's a bone strengthening agent that I was getting by an infusion. Um, they don't do that. Um, so that'll, that'll just be, I guess I'm no longer get them, but, uh, I'm trying to get oral, uh, equivalent of, of, uh, Lupron, uh, and that's still in the works, but I've already gotten, uh, four boxes of stuff. Uh, within a day or two, when the, the RN came, they sent literally four boxes of diapers and chubs and hand lotions, and I don't even know what all was in that box. Um, so very impressive so far. I got some, uh, they sent me some morphine today. Um, she said she would, and sure enough, there it showed up. So, I, I you know, like I said, it's, it's a little premature to, to say exactly how well it's going to work out. But I, I think they're really on top of things, and I've I've been impressed. So Jake, what about the weakness? Can they are they can they address anything about your muscle weakness? No, I don't think they so, can, Herb. Um, Have you asked? I've I've told I haven't asked them specifically if they can do anything. I told them about it, and I said, well, you know, they're they're sitting they're hey. sitting you know they're sitting at the edge of the bed watching me. Uh, leaning on my elbow, but well, no, I didn't say can you do anything. You're your own best advocate, so maybe you should say, "Hey, is there something we can do for this muscle weakness?" Did I, they I, give well, you a hospital? I'll talk to the RN when she comes. I'll ask her. Did they give you a hospital bed? Did they moved a hospital bed in for you so you can prop yourself up, you know, and, no. and maybe pull yourself up and stuff. They offered, but no, I, I did not get one. I, I, I'm just on my regular bed. Um, I'm sure it's there if I need it or if I ask for it. Well, you might you might look at that because you might be able to pull yourself up with some contraption so you can prop it up and not not just lean on your elbow like that. Right. Yeah. I. I. I again, it's it's it, it's it's one of those things. You know, every time you do something like this, it's like another another tick on the on the list. You know, one more thing, one one step closer. So I'm hesitant mm -hmm. about a lot of those things, but they are all there available. Um, they've they've offered to to send me, or they said they'll send me oxygen if I need it, or they will send it to me. They told me to stop uh, the other DME company that was providing it because we're getting ripped, Medicare is getting ripped off for that. They offered to send me a wheelchair, a potty chair, um, and again, all these things are still in the process, still in the works. Um, and I don't know how many of them will pan out as as promised or as discussed, but uh, we'll see. Time will tell. But anyway, so far so good. 
We love you, Jake. And we're thinking, I mean, yeah. not a day goes by when we don't think about you. Well, thanks, Peter. I appreciate that. I think about you guys all the time, too. And I live for these calls. I, I really do. I, no matter how crappy I feel, um, I usually feel better after the calls. And that's thanks to you guys. Even if you're not talking to me specifically, I just feel better. Jake, did they, uh, did you ask them about physical therapy or did they offer that to you? No, I did not. Okay. You know, Jake, I think the, you know, with a little physical therapy, um, that it may help, it may get you mobile again. And, and, and that's really what we all like to see. Um, and, and, you know, lying in bed um, is not going to help strengthen your legs, but it's possible that if you have a decent physical therapist and you have two or three sessions with them and they give you some exercises and you do the exercises, we, we may see you moving around again. Yeah, uh, that, I, I, yeah, that's, that's a very good point, Rick. Uh, I have not discussed it with, with them specifically. I don't even know if they offer it. Again, that gets that, that gets into the area of palliative care versus hospice care. They are definitely a hospice. Um, they're not interested in necessarily in making me better. They're mostly interested in, in uh, you know, keeping me out of pain and comfortable as, as much as possible. But it's certainly definitely worth a question. And I, and I certainly will ask that when, when the RN comes, whatever day it is this week. Did you ask him about the compression machine for your legs to get the blood going no. so you don't get cramps and stuff? No, I did not. No, well, I'm, guessing, I'm guessing, Peter, there, there is, I know I know you guys gave me a lot of suggestions and I, I tried to remember as much as I could, but as I said, she was here for two and a half hours um, and I just kind of, it was overwhelming for me. I was dog tired by the time it was done. And then, you know, the next day another one came and another one came and another one. So it was physically exhausting for me. And I think all of these things will come with time. Um, you know, as, as, as they get settled in and as I get settled in with them in the routine, um, all of these things I can bring up. But I do think it's going to come down to a question of palliative versus hospice. Um, and palliative to me probably, uh, they don't do palliative. Um, even though they're very flexible as far as approving drugs and everything, um, it doesn't sound like they're going to cut anything off, which is, I know Larry Fish mentioned that before. Um, so far, it sounds like they're going to um, continue that. And in fact, they've added, they've given me more drugs. But like f uh, physical therapy, that might be what they consider palliative versus hospice. And so that may or may not be covered. That I do, I do not know. Right. But, but Jake, a lot of us feel like that might help a lot. Amen. Well, I don't, you know, I have to move my legs or I have to move my legs with my arms. Um, right. So I, I can barely move them. I have dead spots. If I, if I, if I raise my leg, hmm. um, you know, from one, from, you know, 90 degrees to 45 degrees, it, my leg collapses. It's like, it's hmm. like there's a dead spot. It just, it just collapses. It's, it's like, there's no, hmm. there's nothing there. Hmm. So I don't know if that's muscular or if that's physical therapy. I think it might be beyond that. It might. Well, it's it would but be good know. for them to assess it. Yeah, I, I will definitely bring it up, guys. Thanks. Okay. Anybody else have any other questions? What was that? Somebody had a question. Does anybody else have any questions about hospice? Yeah. Okay. Um, so. Len, can we get um, can we get Mike Phillips in for a quick update in the last five minutes? Sure, go ahead, Mike. Thank you, Len. Thank you, guys. Uh, well, last week we went and saw Kevin Courtney in, at, at UT Southwestern in Dallas, and he was very helpful. He helped me understand what I needed to do, and and I'm really happy about that. And that basically is what. We're going to go see a radiation oncologist. Yeah, and that's that's in work, and and we have uh, germline uh, testing in work also. So we're waiting to get the results from that. So that's 
that's was that it and that, that's pretty much it so so um so you like kevin courtney and he's definitely a gu medical oncologist and he's closer than going to houston so so that mm -hmm. could be um that that's step one which i think is really good um and it's good for us because we now know that there's a guy in uh, at utsw that we can um that we can talk to um and what um what did he say about the um about the radiation therapy and and the r the uh what are you seeing the ro for well we're we're gonna make i guess we're gonna see about making plans to get uh radiation therapy for my cancer mm -hmm. dr courtney said he he would suggest that probably mike will have nine weeks and we'll stay on um, ADT for two years. And I guess if this fellow that we see in Oklahoma says the same thing, we'll probably be on the track to do that. So one thing I would certainly suggest to you, and you can run it by Courtney, is that um, since this is going to be the first time that you're going to do the radiation, um, see if they can give you um sbrt we've talked about that tonight um for the treatment to the prostate itself because that will reduce your trips from 48 to about um 30. oh okay, okay. and it's, it's okay general. so in other words they, they can squeeze down 20 to 25 of those trips into five treatments okay. with this better i don't want to say better but it's a different type we've talked about it tonight the sbrt and um if it's available to you, you you definitely want to be talking to them about it and or any other suggestion um that they that they may have um you know you may be a candidate and you may be a candidate for high dose brachytherapy Okay. And you can do that in either one or two trips, plus another 25 sessions to your pelvic region, which is definitely what Dr. Courtney is suggesting. Yeah. But there are options to make it a little more convenient for you than going through the, the, the 48 sessions like Len had to do, like Mark Horn is going to have to do. There are guys on this call who have being able to squeeze that down. Um, I mean, I did uh, I did brachytherapy, but I didn't have as much cancer as you. I did seeds, and then I did 25 sessions. But there are options for you um, that that might suit you a little better. And and you'll come back and you'll talk to us, and we'll we can re review what what it's meant with you. So if they don't explain it fully enough, we can. The other thing is. If he's if Dr. Courtney is refer is he referring you to an RO or is he just said you need to find an RO? Well, he he said the one that is in Oklahoma City is is fine, you know. Okay. So, I'm referred by Dr. Stratton. Yeah. So yeah. So the so the just doctor. ask. Be sure to ask him. Um, ask him how much prostate work he does, and yes. also what the alternatives are to the 48 sessions now the problem you've got to be aware of is that if he doesn't have the equipment he may not suggest something okay. and so you've got to say i just like to know what's available not whether you can do it but what right. are the alternatives for me and then that way you can decide do you want to go with him or you want to go with someone else who does offer the other alternatives cool. and then you can run that doctor past dr courtney but again well, just advocate make sure you advocate for yourself so you know your best options okay we'll do that thanks very much rick should we can, right, you us, can you tell us a little bit i mean what about dr courtney's bedside manner was he a nice guy did he he was he, he, he was, was very thorough he was very attentive he he knew my history and and he had notes and we and we talked in a lot of detail 
And we even yeah. asked him, if Mike was your brother or father, what, what would you say to him? And he said, uh, radiation, that's what you need. We were thinking surgery, but I, I think we're feeling like once we visit with the radiation oncologist, we'll be fine with that. Good, thank you. Very good. All right, guys. Listen, I, I, I'm just. We, we've got to, um, we've got to close off, um, close up pretty quickly because we've got another group coming in there in ten minutes. Just want to wish everybody who's here and everybody who listens to this um, broadcast right. regularly, this webcast regularly, a very happy, happy New Year, New Year and a 2022 that brings as much good health for all of you as it possibly can. Um, as you know, this is the end of year when we do our fundraising. Some of you have already made donations. We really appreciate it if you have. If you have um, not, consider us. And if you haven't even opened the email yet, because there's a fair number that haven't opened it, uh, you'll be getting yet another email, but it will only go out to people who haven't opened it yet. So if you got it, uh, it came twice already. And thank you so much for everybody who's donated. And and if not, just keep us in mind. And and that's it. You know, we don't do this very often, as you know. This, we only do it in December, and and uh, so just bear with us. It's, this is this is not going to be a, a a weekly repeat. Oh, and I should say. Uh, we do have a webinar tomorrow night, but it's probably gonna, not going to be of much interest to most of the guys on here. It's it's really for people with low, early and low um, disease, um, with a really good urologist who trained with um, um, with Peter Carroll, Kirsten Green. But Joe's on here, so I have to mention it. Otherwise, it's, he, he, he won't talk to me. Thursday. Uh, Thursday, sorry. Thirtieth, right? Yep. 30th. Yeah. 30th. Yep. 30th. Whatever day that is. <laughs> yeah, right. yeah, 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 yeah. All right, everybody, thank you so much. And uh, we'll see you. We'll be, we'll be everybody. Good night all. Good night all. Yeah, we'll Happy be back New Year. next week. Goodbye. Happy New Year.